Good morning and welcome to the What's Up News Network, being broadcast from Panama City Beach, Florida, the home of the world's most beautiful beaches. I am Jim Free with Jim Free Realty. Please click on the red subscribe button just below. In the local news, Tyndall Air Force Base was once home of the F-22 Raptors. That is no longer the case as of Friday. Air Force officials announced that the F-22 fighter jet training operation is moving its untimely a question of whether they want to house the FTU, which is what this program is, and it looks like it's going to Langley Air Force Base in Virginia. Uh, military leaders have talked about the future of the F-22 since Hurricane Michael damaged Tyndall Air Force Base. Tyndall with the Gulf Training Range will continue to be a viable part of the country's defense. A short-term loss for the F-22 mission at Tyndall, but a long-term gain for the F-35 that's coming in 2023. As for the move to Virginia, when will it happen? We don't know. have a specific date yet. Uh, but uh, things are going well out at Tyndall. They're taking care of all the damage that they had from Hurricane Michael. In the state news, the collapse of the uh, condo towers in Miami is a disaster, not only for the loss of many lives, but also the loss of investment for unit owners. A lot of us that own condo units are satisfied to let the HOA board and the CAM manager make all the decisions about our complex. We must get involved. Most of the problems arise from deferred maintenance. This appears to be the case in the Champlain Towers. This complex and HOA will not survive. They will be inundated with lawsuits that will far exceed their insurance coverage and the value of the land that it sets on. That cost was estimated in an engineering report from Morbido Consulting Engineering Firm in 2018, meant that owner at uh, Champlain Tower South were facing payments of anywhere from $80,000 for a one bedroom to $330,000 or so for a penthouse. This is a special assessment to be paid all at once or in installments. The first deadline was scheduled for this July the 1st. Engineer and construction experts say the Morbito uh, documents that focus just on the structural work make clear there were several major repairs that needed to be done as soon as possible. Other than some roof repairs, that work has not begun. So three years later, we had the collapse. It might be some time before we know exactly what caused the structure to fail. Some thinks it was construction errors from the beginning. A few think it was caused by climate change, but from what we know now, it might, might have been caused by deferred maintenance. We do know from the Morbido Consultants Engineering Firm notification of to the HOA in 2018 made it clear that there were several major structural repairs that needed to be made as soon as possible. Those of us who live on the coast know that we live in a harsh environment that is very corrosive to metal. We have all heard the stories of how strong winds can drive a straw through a post. Well, it can also drive salt water through stucco. I witnessed the destruction power of the salt water on metal studs in a complex where I've owned several units. The HOA was having the complex painted and sealed. The contractor discovered that the exterior walls on the west side of the complex were unstable and when they removed the sheetrock, they discovered that the metal studs had been eaten up by the salt water that had penetrated the stucco and in some units, the only thing holding the walls up was the sheetrock. In 1995, Hurricane Opal, a Cat 4 hurricane, made landfall near Pensacola. Panama City Beach was on the east side of the storm and had strong winds as a result. The HOA boards 
had over the years bragged about having the lowest HOA fees on the beach. In order to maintain the low fees, they had to defer maintenance, which always catches up with you. Two years after we have had a Cat 5 hurricane, Michael hit us here in Panama City, in Panama City Beach and Mexico Beach. A few of the complexes have not been repaired, the damage from the storm. They have not resealed their buildings. If salt water penetrates the concrete, it will start corrosion on the rebar. During the corrosion process, the rebar will expand, causing concrete spalling to affect the breaking and cracking of concrete. Some self-centered HOA members may think it makes good for them to have large bank accounts or large reserve accounts, but if they are neglecting maintenance, it will catch up to them and will be more expensive to correct. Concrete spalling is not always visible to the naked eye because it is covered by sheetrock or stucco. If your board is deferring maintenance, you need to build a fire under them to get them on the move to get things done or get them off the board. I have laid off lawyer stories for a while. I guess it was because my grandson-in-law is one of them and he's one of the good guys. I've always thought lawyers or is anybody's dog that will throw them a bone. We have a couple of lawyers in Booga Holler and even have one judge. Many years ago, I was a small claims judge in Booga Holler. My authority was very limited. I could only hear small civil suits and I could issue arrest and search warrants. I have to make a disclaimer, but a disclaimer about these stories I'm about to tell you. These stories are not about Booger Holler residents. The residents of Booger Holler are so good, they have to hold on to the blackberry bushes to keep them being drawn into heaven. One of the first things you're taught in law school is never ask a question that you don't already know the answer. Attorney Bobby Lee Fry was representing a client that was accused of mayhem. He was accused of biting a man's ear off during a bar fight. One of the prosecutor's witnesses was Danny Howard. When it came time for Bobby Lee to question Danny, he said, Mr. Howard, had you been drinking that night? Yes, sir, I had three beers. Now, you didn't actually see my client bite his ear off, did you? No, sir, I did not. Now Bobby Lee felt he was on a roll, so he thought he would ask one more question to nail it down. Now, Mr. Howard, what did you see? I saw him spit it out. Attorney Charles Patton was defending Bobby Joe Smith on a murder charge. The prosecutor's witness was Vester Pruitt, who testified that he saw Bobby Joe Smith shoot Billy Rainwater on the corner of 2nd Avenue and 3rd Street. When it came time for Charles to question the witness, he said, Mr. Pruitt, what time of night did you, this occur? I think it was about 10 o'clock at night. Mr. Pruitt, I understand your testimony that the street light was out. Is that correct? Yes, sir, it was out. Mr. Howard, how old are you? I'll be 85 my next birthday. I noticed you were wearing glasses, Mr. Howard. Were you wearing glasses the night you say you saw my client shoot Mr. Rainwater? No, sir. How good is your eyesight without the glasses? Well, pretty good. Not as good as it was when I was a young man. Mr. Pruitt, how far were you from the shooting? Oh, about a half a block. Mr. Pruitt, you have testified that the shooting took place at 10 o'clock at night. The street light was out. You were wearing, weren't wearing your glasses. You will soon be 85 years old. Your eyesight is failing, and according to your testimony, you were a half a block from the shooting. Would you please tell the jury how far you can see at night? Well, Mr. Patton, I ain't rightly sure. How far is the moon?
in the national news. Attorney General Merrick Garland announced that the Justice Department is filing suit against the state of Georgia. What a shame. Our Justice Department has become so politically corrupt. I guess when our Commander-in-Chief said the Georgia law was Jim Crow on steroids, Merrick had to jump up. And Chuck Schumer is concerned that the dead Democrats will no longer be able to vote in Georgia elections. The Democratic Party in New York City mayor primary has a little problem with their voting. It seems that they forgot to take 135,000 test ballots out of the computer. Do you suppose that could have happened in November as well? We're celebrating our independence. This is an example where good men stood up for what is right and put everything on the line, their lives and their fortunes. For all of us on July the 4th, 1776, since then thousands upon thousands of men and women have given their lives to preserve that freedom. Recently I received a letter from Louis Grazano. Louis is the last living witness to the unconditional surrender of the German High Command. The surrender occurred in room 119 of a little red schoolhouse in France. Louis is now 98 years old and I would like to read you his letter. Dear Jim, there are some moments you never forget. I will never forget the chaos and carnage I witnessed as part of the third wave to land on Omaha Beach. I'll never forget the sting of the frostbite of my toes during the Battle of the Bulge. And I'll never forget what happened on May the 7th, 1945. I was standing in room 119 of the Little Red Schoolhouse in France that served as General Eisenhower's headquarters. The room was packed with dignitaries from France, Great Britain, Russia, and the United States. They were all there to witness representatives from the German <coughs> High Command sign the official documents of unconditional surrender ending the Nazi Germany reign of terror. The ceremony was simple and brief. It only took 17 minutes to officially end the war that had raged for six bloody years. I don't know how much longer I'll be around to tell my story, which is why I'm so grateful to know that the American Veterans Center and the World War II Veterans Committee is dedicated to preserving my story even when me and the, my fellow World War II veterans aren't here to tell it. You see, the folks over at AVC and World War II Veterans Committee acknowledge what most people refuse to admit, that our nation's schools have failed us. History books these days barely even mention World War II, and heroes like Audie Murphy and Jimmy Doolittle have become little more than footnotes in history. As a result, most of today's youth know little about how the United States pulled together to defeat the greatest threats to liberty the world has ever known. More importantly, today, youth aren't being taught the values that help us win the war. This is a shame. America will only remain strong and free if we remember the sacrifices that were made for our freedom. I would like for you to watch American Veterans Center YouTube interview with Louis Grisano. I think it will be beneficial and well worth your time to do so. Welcome to Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus. I'm honored to be joined today by Louis Graziano. He is a World War II veteran of the U.S. Army. He's also the author of a Patriot's Memoirs of World War II. And Mr. Graziano, thank you very much for being with us. Well, thank you. Well, we got on the ship, we had to drive 700 miles to go to the English Channel to cross the ocean. And uh, we were supposed to have assistant driver, and my assistant driver didn't drive. 
But I didn't let them know that because he was a good buddy of mine and kept me laughing and <laughs> kept me awake. We had this, every 100 miles we stopped for a 10 minute break. So when we got to the uh, ship, then I, all my men was with me. I had 35 of them. We loaded up all the uh, trucks and stuff that we needed. And then we landed into uh, Omaha Beach and we had to just wait till it was time for the third wave. I was in the third wave to go in and and we had the ships had to go around. There was so many ships that was crowded. And finally the time came in for me to go in. And I drove a gasoline truck off the LST onto the beach. And I jumped out of it real quick and got my guns and flamethrower and a flare and laid down the ground on the beach there with the dead soldiers. And then I had to crawl up underneath the cliff, so, but I had to move slowly every time the Germans would be shooting. I'd move up a little bit till I got underneath the cliff. Then when I got under the cliff, I got my flamethrower out, and I took two of them to shoot that, and we shot up underneath the cliff with a machine gun on top, was shooting down at us, and I put that all on fire underneath them. So that got rid of that machine gun. And then I shot the flare up in the sky, and I knew the Navy would know what I wanted, and they saw that, and they shot and hit the target there and got rid of some more machine guns up there. Then I laid underneath the cliff that night and the rangers came in. And they were the first ones to go up the cliff. They had put these uh, rope ladders up to go up and it was a, so between 100 and 170 feet high. And as they were climbing, the Germans were cutting some of those ropes, and they had to jump to another rope and keep shooting. They got rid of some of those machine guns on their way up there. <clears throat> then I told my men we had to go up, and some of my, and I lost two of my men as we made the landing there. And that, the ones that didn't have guns, I told them to get the gun off the dead soldiers and follow me up the cliff which we did, and then we had to fight our way up to it. They were still shooting at us. And we finally got up there, and then we were farting our way all the way to St. Lowe. And that took 43 days to secure St. Lowe's. And then we continued driving, fighting all our way up to Reims, France. And then when I got to Reims, Captain Trasher, or General Thrasher came up to me and put me in charge of the utilities and told me I had to go get some supplies for the soldiers and we're going to stay there to work at uh, Reims, France. And gave me a, a book that had French and English in it. So I took one of my men with me. We went to the... Uh, Lumber yard where they had all the stuff that we needed. And I pointed to all the different things that I wanted, and the Frenchman had all the stuff I needed, but he wouldn't sell it to me. So then I turned around, went back to camp. And I got me four men in a big truck. I says, "Follow me." We went back over there. And I told him I wanted that stuff, and he said, "No, can't sell it to you." I said, we're here to free your country and you don't want to have sell it to us? So I got my pistol out and sh pointed it right at them. I said, okay, men, load it all up. So they loaded it all up and I gave him a paper to take to the army to get his money for all the stuff we got. I went back to camp and I told the general what I'd done. He said, oh, me, we're going to get in trouble. I said, no, we're not, sir. I says, he's afraid I'm going to come back and get him. And we didn't have no trouble.
So let me back up just a little bit here, back to when you're on the beach, because <laughs> okay. one of the things I've heard from other veterans of that day was the noise, the deafening noise, the, the commotion of the moment. How would you describe it? Well, it was terrible noise and all there, but uh, you just had to not pay much attention. You just had to go on because we had a job to do. We had to do it. General left. Engineer says, you know, engineer, how you think you're going to do it? And I wouldn't tell him how I was going to do it. So within three weeks, I put the mess hole up. Next thing you know, the general transferred the major route, which was, he was in charge of uh, all the city of Reims and the little red schoolhouse and all. And he put me in charge of all the Reims and the little red schoolhouse. So that's how I got into that little red schoolhouse to be in the room for the surrender. For the surrender? Yeah. What was it like in there? It was terrible in there. I mean, it, the Germans that came in, they were just straight faces. And they just stood up and didn't smile at all. And finally, the... Uh, they all had a place to sit. There was the uh, British were there, the French and the Russians. All of them had to sign that paper in there for the surrender. And after that was signed, the uh, German Germans, they stood up, just nodded their heads. And then we took them up to uh, Eisenhower, had two rooms up the hall. He put temporary office there, and he wanted them to come up there to him after we surrounded. He didn't want to be in the room with them when the surrounding was taken. So we took him up there, and they come in, and he, first thing he asked them was they satisfied with the way the things went for the signing. They said yes, and he dismissed them. <clears throat> that was the end of that. Now, you had spent time with Eisenhower before that, right? Yes, I uh, I had to put special telephone line in Eisenhower's headquarters or where he was staying. And uh, I spent two nights there with him before I went back to camp. And he was real nice with us. I had my buddy with me, and uh, he said that let's, the officers had enough rank take care of themselves, so I take care of the listed men. <laughs> <laughs> You're listening to Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus, honored to be joined today by Louis Graziano, U.S. Army veteran of World War II and of D-Day, as well as the Battle of the Bulge, and that's what we're going to talk about now. Um, where was your unit placed at the Bulge? Um, <clears throat> the captain came in one night in my quarters, and he says, I want you to go on a special mission with me. I said, is that a request or an order? He says, I can put it in an order. I said, let's go. <laughs> so, and it was snowing like anything and cold. We had to go find General Patton's, uh, part of his troop that got lost, that he needed in Bastogne. In Bastogne, they were cut off for six weeks. The German had them cut off. So we went out and we found them between Metz and Reims, and we took them all the way to Bastogne. And that's when I got the frozen feet on our trip up to Bastogne. We got them and got them freed from the Germans. And then the captain and I went back to Reims after that, and they put me in the hospital for my frozen feet. It says I got there just in time. It'd been another day I'd have lost them. So they treated them. And then the, uh, but then we, uh, I was there for two weeks and they said, and I said, I want to get back out with my men. I says, well, if you can get, 
pair of shoes that's two sizes bigger and put two pairs of socks on and we'll let you out. So I told my mess sergeant, I said, you be, not mess sergeant, my supply sergeant, to go find me some shoes. So he did because he knew I'd give him a hard time if he didn't. <laughs> so I got out with my men again. How do your feet respond to cold even now? Well, they're, I can feel the cold right away. And they, they just get all, all that way. Mm. That. Wow. Mm -hmm. They so, gave me trouble, but I go on. What, when you think about your service, what do you think of most? Well, I think I was honored to be there and I did everything I was supposed to do. I didn't let nothing bother me, any job. I was sent to so many different places to do different things, you know because I was with General Eisenhower's headquarters Special Troop Command. And uh, any time they needed something special, they'd send me out to do it. I was glad to do it. It's amazing. And I think it was an honor. I had the chance as a student to see the room in the Little Red Schoolhouse where the signing took place, and now it's behind plexiglass. Yeah, I... With, I uh, almost silhouettes of who was who is sitting at the table and so forth. And right. obviously it looks a little bit different than it did that day. Yeah, I took care of that room there. And that was quite a big table there too. It was- Yeah, you had to fit a lot of people said, around there. Yeah. <laughs> well, Louie, we thank you very much for your service to our country, uh, most of all. And we thank you also for your time with us today. Thank you yeah, for coming thank in. Thank you, I appreciate that. Louie Graziano is a U.S. Army veteran of World War II. He saw action at D-Day and also served at the Battle of the Bulge and was a witness to the signing of the German surrender on May 7th, 1945. Last survivor. Last survivor, exactly right. I'm Greg Karumbas, this is Veterans Chronicles. In listening to Lewis, it reminded me of my dad. He had to leave me and my mother when I was just a few weeks old. I didn't see him till I was three years old. My grandfather would carry me to the movie theater where they would show newsreel footage of the war effort. My grandfather had several sons in the war. I remember when the war was over, my mother carried me to town and the streets were full of people. Some were singing and some were firing shotguns and I was scared. My mom had to pick me up and hold me because I was frightened for the, didn't understand what was going on. I was fortunate. My dad returned home safe and a lot of dads and mothers didn't. There is a lot of evil trying to destroy this land that was dedicated to our Lord. Evil will not prevail. But to understand it better, read Jude, which is the shortest book in the Bible, only one chapter. Until we meet again, may God bless you, your family, and this great nation every day.